Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Hooray. Nice to see you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're really excited to have you. Um, really, really thrilled to be talking about relationship between Foundry and Autodesk, and also to be hearing some things about the really exciting work that Google is doing with cloud right now. So to quickly introduce myself, my name is Natty Laser. I'm a product manager at Foundry in charge of Flix, which I'll be delving into a little bit later on. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys an introduction to the evening and what you guys can be expecting. Um, so first, Todd is going to kick us off with an overview of cloud and what Google is doing with that, particularly as it pertains to media production. Then we're going to be getting into Shotgun with Ken LaRue, looking at how Shotgun and Nuke work together. Um, so that'll be very enlightening for all of us. And then at the very end, hooray, drinks and networking. I know everyone's rather excited for that. The bar's going to be open throughout this. Um, if you're going to go get a drink, please do so. Just don't hang out and be too rowdy or whatever <laughs> while you do so. All right. So um, really quickly, I just want to give you guys an overview of Foundry in 2017 and all the things that are changing. So for those of you who are freaking out, where's the the? the, the where did it go? We rebranded. We are now just Foundry. It happened. It's very exciting. So foundry.com, that's where you can find us now. We also have a good series of webinars coming out that you can watch. You can ask your questions when they come out. So that's going to include Nuke, Nuke Studio, Car of Yar, and lots more. Um, and we also have some new integrations we're working on. So Shotgun now supports Nuke 10.5. Very exciting. Um, that includes Nuke Studio. And Google Zinc now also supports Nuke 10.5. Um, the last thing that I want to call out for this is that we have an open call for our showreel for this year. So if you have any great content that you'd like to highlight in Foundry Showreel, talk to Jen. She's standing right over there. And she can help you get you guys folded in. And if you want to stay in touch with Foundry, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you guys know where to find us. Um, so a few really, really quick thank yous before we dive into this. First of all, thank you Autodesk and Shotgun for opening this up. We're really excited to highlight the collaboration. Thank you to Google Cloud um, for this beautiful space and the beautiful venue. It's really, really great to have it. Thank you to Film360 VR um, for coordinating the meetup group. Really, really helped as well. And thank you to VFX Technology, uh, Film Animation VR Video Meetup Group. Um, so at this point, I'm going to kick it off to Todd, who's going to speak to Google Cloud, um, and he'll get it started for you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you. So hey, everyone. I'm Todd Previs. I'm the product manager for rendering on Google Cloud Platform. I'm just going to give you guys a 10, 12-minute overview of some of the things we've been doing uh, over the last few years. So when you look at rendering on Google Cloud Platform, it really is just one part of our end-to-end -end solution. So we have solutions. Um, all the way from ingestion, all the way out through to final um, content delivery. So we like to call it from glass to glass. And when you're first on set, shooting your project, all the way to when it's finally being distributed to your viewer, whether they're on an Android device, at the cinema, or at home watching television. Uh, the context of this, of course, is, is really all about rendering and visual effects space. Uh, we've had some pretty awesome successes on Google Cloud Platform uh, on the rendering side of things. Uh, we did a case study with Framestore actually a few years ago, how they've been using Google Cloud Platform for burst rendering. Atomic Fiction, which is a studio I'm sure many of you know, uh, have been using the cloud for rendering for five years or so. And actually, most recently, at our Google Cloud uh, Next conference in uh, San Francisco a few weeks ago, we had MPC presenting some of the work they did on Jungle Book. So that film won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects. And again, a substantial amount of it was rendered uh, on Google Cloud Platform using our infrastructure. And our infrastructure really at its core um, is what all of our rendering solutions, all of our media solutions are built on. So when you think of Google, think of a company that has had that has seven products with over a billion users, right? So Google Cloud Platform and that, that infrastructure that's now available to you is the same infrastructure that powers Google on a day in and day out basis. It's the same infrastructure we use for compute, for networking, for storage. So all of the core tenants available to you for, for rendering uh, are what we use at Google to, to run our business day to day. Um, just to go through some highlights, um, in terms of compute, we have very fast VMs, very fast startup times, very consistent performance. We have custom VMs, so you can actually configure a VM to the exact core and RAM specification that you want. So this allows for massive scalability, and this is uh, concurrent to our pricing model and our pricing methodology. We're always cutting prices, and we bill on a per minute basis. So if you think about paying on a permanent basis, no upfront commitments for compute resources, um, the example I like to give is you have 500 frames to render. So go ahead and spin up 500 VMs 
and render the entire job in parallel, one VM per frame. Uh, and you're only ever paying for what you consume. There's no, no pre-buying of instances, no having to rent gear and bring that in and have it sit there. It's literally on-demand, massive compute scale uh, when you need it uh, at any time. Uh, in terms of the actual rendering technologies that we're, um, that we're working towards on top of the platform, uh, we've got a few things that I'm going to just talk about very briefly. Uh, we work very closely with m many of the uh, leading ISVs, so we work very closely with both Autodesk and the Foundry uh, in terms of helping uh, provision on-demand licensing for customers. Uh, so those are for customers that want uh, an infrastructure as a service, kind of build your own pipeline rendering solution. So people like Framestore, people like MPC, people like Atomic Fiction. And then for smaller studios, we also have a solution called Zinc Render, which is a turnkey solution. And just a quick show of hands tonight, how many of you have heard of Zinc Render? Okay, cool. I'll give you a quick demo of that. Um, so it really is all about offering you a solution that fits within your workflow. So whether you're a big studio, you've got a lot of custom tools, your own queue management system, or you're a small studio and you just want a plug and play solution. And the security aspect of it, we also realize is incredibly important for this industry. Um, certainly there are restrictions that studios put in place and, and our attitude has been to actually work directly with all the major studios to educate them on our cloud, uh, our cloud platform uh, and to work with them for certification standards. So we work closely with studios like Disney, with Paramount with Universal uh, to enable our customers doing custom infrastructure as a service deployments on Google Cloud Platform to utilize us for tier one sensitive feature film content. You know, as I mentioned before, Jungle Book, Oscar winner for best visual effects, a significant amount of that was rendered on Google Cloud Platform by MPC. Uh, and then on the turnkey side, we have Zinc, and I just want to give you a very quick demo of it, but essentially it's a plugin that runs inside of most of the popular DCC applications. So Maya, Houdini, Cinema 4D, Nuke, we support most of the popular renderers, V-Ray, Arnold, RenderMan, and it allows you to use, utilize the scale of Google Cloud Platform pretty much on demand. So I've got a very quick demo. I just want to pop over to Maya for you and show you this. So I've got a Maya scene here, and I've got the Zinc plugin installed. It's a pretty basic scene, but if I want to render this, I can simply launch the Zinc plugin inside of Maya, and it's going to pop up with a dialog box. And essentially, this dialog box lets you sync all of your assets and send the render up to the cloud. And without going through all the details here, you can see the number of machines I can add. So I'll just pick five machines here. You can use up to 500 machines. So that's 32,000 cores. Um, I can choose the different types of machines. I'll use a 32-core machine. We see we also have 64-core machines. Um, it'll automatically parse your scene for all the assets, upload those for you. It'll output the renders back to your output directory. So there's no fetching of files. There's no FTPing things up, FTPing things down. It just works, right? I just pick my render layer. It knows the render I'm using. Go ahead and set my chunk size to one here and go ahead and uh, submit the render. So again, I'm going through this very quickly, but the idea is Zinc handles all the asset management for you. There's no need to parse your scene, no need to look for dependencies for external files. Everything is handled and uploaded, and you can actually upload those files ahead of time to Google Cloud Platform, to Zinc, um, before render time, which is really handy if you've got a lot of different um, you know, textures or assets or large files that are actually being used in the, in the scene. So I've got another render I fired off earlier, and just to kind of give you an overview, this is our web console, so this looks pretty much like any queue management system out there. You can see the status. In this case, I have two machines running. You can see all of the different frames, and those frames, as they're done rendering, uh, will output to the local directory. So I've got a directory here, and you can see these frames just popping in as they finish. So it's all about having an integrated, scalable solution. You can just see, again, my first, uh, my first frame from that. But all of this on the back end is supported with our licensing agreements with all these ISVs. So when I say we have support for all these applications, we have licensing support. So yes, you want to spin up 500 nodes of uh, 64 cores of uh, V-Ray or Arnold out of Maya or out of Nuke, you can do that um, thanks to Zinc. So that's kind of a quick overview of the, uh, the Zinc service. And then in terms of uh, infrastructure as a service, as I mentioned before, we're working closely with uh, a lot of the major ISVs to provide on-demand licensing in that capacity. We also work with Avere, which is a very well-known caching and high-performance uh, high caching appliance. Um, they have a, an on-premise uh, virtual, they have an on-premise filer as well as a virtual file system that runs on the Google Cloud Platform. And this, again, is used by a lot of major studios that want to scale to 50, 60, 70,000 cores and be able to, to um, maintain performance when running on the cloud. 
Um, just a quick overview of some of the customers that have used Google Cloud Platform for rendering now. It's a, pretty much a who's who of visual effects. You've got the mill, you've got Framestore, you've got MPC, you've got Method, uh, Rodeo Effects, Luma Pictures, who's not up there, have done a lot of work on Google Cloud Platform, Blur. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty impressive, you know, having been at Google now for two and a half years and sort of seen the evolution of, of rendering on the cloud. Um, when I started, it was, you know, one or two of these studios, and now we pretty much have either or all of the major studios are in discussions with all of the major visual effects houses um, to use Google Cloud Platform for rendering. Um, so I would invite you to chat with any of us. There are a bunch of Googlers here. We've all got our little, little badges on if you want to talk to us and learn more about our infrastructure as a service renderings or Zinc or any other questions you have are on Google Cloud Platform on media. Um, thanks for your time, and I'll turn it over to Ken LaRue now from Autodesk. Just want to plug in my laptop here real quick. Where was the outlet? Bear with us, sorry. Uh, I like to see you, sorry. Thank you. All right. So my name is Kent LaRue. I'm from Autodesk, and I'm focusing on shotgun here. Um, let me make sure we get to the right slide. So in the beginning of my presentation, what I want to do is give a quick overview of what Shotgun is, because I'm not sure if everyone knows what it is. Uh, Shotgun is a tool that combines production, review, and tracking tools all on one platform. And it also integrates into the most commonly used creative tools, Nuke being one of them. And what this allows a studio to do is watch and follow their production as it moves through the pipeline and make sure that it stays on track, stays on budget, and if anything starts to go wrong, they can correct it quickly, and in the end, they finish their job on time. Now, it doesn't matter what size studio you are. If you are eight people in one local building, or you are hundreds globally around the world, Shotgun is an essential tool in today's production environment. And the reason being is because everybody in your team, no matter what size, you are connected, you're getting the information you need, and you are allowed to do your job as most efficiently as you possibly can. So let's talk about putting a team together. You got a project, right? And you put your team together, and it's a bunch of people, whether they're local or all over the world, the, everyone has their own tasks or their own responsibilities, and, but they're also dependent on other people on the team. So someone's job may not be able to start until this person finishes this and so on. And this is where the connection and the communication of your team is so essential. And if you're not using a central database as something like Shotgun, you're probably using several different tools or processes that while they might work, they're probably not as efficient as they could be. So for example, you're gonna use emails for communication. You're using Dropboxes to put files in. You're using spreadsheets to track who's doing what. You're using Google Docs to formulate different plans for everyone working on. You're gonna go put a Post-it note on someone's computer when they're not at that computer because you need to tell them what to do just to facilitate communication and collaboration. Now, if you're doing this, and maybe you're a small studio and you're working on a really simple project, this might work. But the problem is none of those Things are connected. Nothing is actually integrated, and there's no one place you can go to to get the, the solution or the answer you need, the information you need, when you need it, because they're not connected. So while we say a small project, we all know that there is no such thing as a small project. There's no such thing as a small pipeline. And suddenly you've got total chaos, because all these things are all over the place, and you cannot find the information you want. Communication gets broken. Files are lost. And in the end, you don't have an efficient pipeline. And that's really where shock comes in. So as I said in the beginning, Shotgun is a production platform for tracking, for scheduling, for viewing, sharing, reviewing, collaborating, because everyone is accessing the same information. You're going to our database that's on the cloud, on our secure servers, no matter where your team is. If you're in Europe, you're in Asia, you're here in the States or Canada, everyone's accessing the same information. So you are all connected. That is really the benefit of Shotgun. Tonight, our presentation, we're gonna focus on the integration of Shotgun inside of Nuke. And the real part of my presentation, what I'm gonna talk about is how an artist who needs to submit versions and iterations to their supervisor, who they're not in the same place, one's in London, one's in Chicago, and they need to be able to communicate back and forth to allow each one of them to work as efficiently as possible. Now, I also wanna stress that in my presentation, I normally do this demo, I'm not lucky to have a talented Nuke artist like Terry who's gonna actually walk through the steps in Nuke. In my demo, I take credit for everything Terry does, okay? I am the artist, and Jocelyn is my supervisor. And what I do is I open up Nuke 
when all the work is done, and I say I do it, and I just show you how I render that out and share it with my supervisor. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to give you a little spill like I'm doing. We're going to bring Terry up here. Terry's going to walk through some really cool things with new Kankara, and at a point he's going to stop where a typical workflow would be. He needs to share this with his supervisor. I'm going to come up here, take credit for everything Carrie did, and then I'm going to show how Shotgun would help him share that with his supervisor, and then we're going to do that a couple times going back and forth. So for right now, I'm going to invite Terry up here, who's going to introduce you to Nuke, obviously, and so some really cool things. I will minimize my presentation, and I'll be back in a minute after Terry's done. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, sir. Okay, so if you are not familiar with Nuke, it's a compositing package from Foundry. Uh, if I can safely say the last movie you saw in a theater, it touched Nuke at some point. Uh, so not only film, but television, commercial work. It's really a flagship product uh, from Foundry. So tonight we're going to take a look at Nuke, but also we're going to look at CAR VR. And if you're not familiar with CAR, it's compositing AR and VR. That's what CAR stands for. It's a plug-in for Nuke. And it comes with a suite of tools, uh, not only from getting your cameras and every individual view into a lat long, but also with uh, additional tools when you're dealing with VR and some challenging things. So we're going to take a look at a challenging shot. And we'll really focus in for this Nuke script on three nodes, which is the camera solver, the color matcher, and the stitcher. So with these three nodes, we'll be able to take a six camera rig and get a lat long image out of it. So this is the footage we're looking at now. I like this footage because it is very challenging. It's almost like impossible footage. If you look on towards the right hand side, you can see it's sort of a Frankenstein rig. So there is a six camera rig. It's on a tripod. It's being lifted up in the air and we're walking along with it. So this is a tough shot to deal with uh, right out of the gate. So we're going to take a look at how we can sort of approach this uh, using Kara. So we have our six cameras. You create a camera solver, a C camera solver, which is Kara's camera solver. And what's happening is we have all six cameras laid out on top of each other. And we're going to make some choices here for what we're going to do and try and get our solve out. We have presets. So maybe the stitch was done in PT GUI. You can import a PTS file. Maybe it's a Freedom 360, 360 broadcaster, a Pro 6, 7, or 14, Z3X, Jaunt 1, Ozo, or the Google Jump. Now, if you don't have any of these rigs, maybe using a custom rig or something else, you can always set up your own rig, set your global parameters, your focal length, film back for different camera types, as well as your sensor size. Now, the first attribute we're going to take a look at is keying. So what this means is it's going to analyze keyframes, and it's going to be putting keyframes for when we need it. And this kind of depends on what your footage is. If we were out and we had a stationary camera and it's very calm, we're not going to need a lot of keyframes. If we're in a more high action shot or something more erratic like this shot is, we're going to need to have more steps in our keyframes. We're going to need some analyzation every once in a while. So for a shot like this, I would go down with two. If we don't do that, the shot will start to split apart as we're going on. So you go ahead and key all, and you'll notice in the timeline now we have keyframes all the way across. Now this is also an animated camera. It's a moving camera, so we could solve for an animated camera. I'm only going to analyze one keyframe, so I'll just delete those ones. So the next thing we need to look at is focal length. So with CAR, we're going to assume that we have the same camera looking in every direction, and it has the same lens, so we're going to optimize single. If we had a different camera on one of the, on the rig, or maybe it was a different lens or a different focal length, then we can optimize per camera, and of course, if we know the focal length. Same thing with distortion. We're going to assume that there's no lens distortion. But we can optimize single. If there's, again, maybe a different lens, we can optimize per camera or our known distortion. So I'll leave this at no lens distortion. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is match. So Kara is going to go through and analyze this, go look at all the different cameras and find all those overlapping points and give us matches for them. So I'll jump back to the keyframe where the matches are. And what you'll see is a whole bunch of matches. So it's great. It found overlaps. And now we can actually solve for this. So when I click solve, we're going to see the image unwrap. Now, if you think about the solve error, we want to focus in on this. We want to obviously reduce this number. Now, this is different than when you're dealing with tracking software, and that's something that you can relate to on the solve error uh, attribute. And normally with that, you want to get a really low, no, low number. You want to be at 1.5, you want to be at 1, or you want to be at 0.5. Uh, here we have more leeway. If we're under 7, we're in actually pretty good shape, and we are here right now. So what I'll do is I'm just going to grab this as the horizon line tool. 
and push the image uh, around just into a position where uh, we can get it correct. So we'll do something like this. There we go. And we can tweak this later on. So I'm going to jump back over to uh, the points. So the first thing we can do is reject the points. And once we reject them, our solve error is not now dropped. It was at 6.7, now it's at 4.7, so we're in even better shape. The nice thing about Cara is you only want so much automation with software uh, when it comes down to the actual artistry because you need to get that manual control. You, nothing always, you know, never goes perfect when you're out uh, on set or whether, whether you're shooting out somewhere. So you need to get in there and get into that manual control. So this way we could also be picking points, uh, we can be rejecting points. There's a match tool uh, where we can even add additional points. So if I went over here and I uh, added a point, we'll see the two cameras that it's coming from, and then we can go ahead and position them uh, in 3D space, uh, sorry, in the, in the 2D view to match those two points. And we're now creating our own points. So we can have supervised points that we're putting on top uh, as well. And then we also have this, is, and this is a nice sort of overview on what's happening with our solve. It's color coded, so if we had a high error area or in the overlaps, it would be red. Now what this is telling us is that in this little section here, there's 137 overlapping points, and the solve error average for this section is at 4.83. And then of course we have a horizon line tool. So there's two guides in here. One is the center line, which is the horizon line where we want to straighten things out. And then also you have the center uh, point itself. And this is when you first put on uh, your headset, this is what you're gonna be looking at would be uh, the first image you would have. So say, okay, now the cool thing of what Car is doing here is if we look behind the scenes, we take a look at the 3D view, it's actually recreated the rig that we had in 3D space. And this is very important because it opens us to the whole world of using 3D space alongside with your stitch. And not only that, you have control over all the cameras. You have all the information of where they're looking, their sensor size. We can link cameras, unlink cameras together. Uh, we can change the type of feathering. Like VR and, and doing the blend is all about the nice soft blending of the alpha. And we have control on the type that we want to do for each one of the cameras or all of them. And we can adjust the feathering as well. You also have an uh, option for rig size, and this is in meters. So this is more, it, the more relative this is to the actual rig size on set, it's gonna normalize all these numbers so you're not dealing with the 0.003. It's kind of like the same reason if you were gonna model a car in 3D space, you would model it to scale. So now another thing we wanna look at, an important attribute is the converge point. So this is where our left eye and our right eye meets, and we wanna focus in on what the point of the shot is. This is kind of like a wide shot. So say we wanted this area uh, to be the focus of the shot, how we understand or uh, get to a number for our converge point is if I go really extreme here and go two, you see the image is split apart. Now if I go three, you'll start to see it come together. So when you find that area where it comes together is where you wanna be. If you go too far, it's gonna start going in the other direction. So say, okay, I'm happy with this preview stitch. I wanna move on to the next section and the next section being a color match, uh, the, the color matcher because our cameras are looking in all different directions, and because of that, you're gonna have exposure issues. Uh, say the sun is in one camera versus the other. We need to sort of normalize uh, all of this. So the color matcher is very nice. It's non-destructive, uses exposure or exposure in color, which essentially gain, uh, gain and white balance. So it's gonna be changing the stops uh, on the camera as well as making any tonal adjustments. Uh, same thing with the keys. If we have a lot of luminance shifting, if we're going from dark to light, you want to have a lower step size uh, of keyframes uh, to accommodate for that. So once we do that, we can go ahead and analyze. So it's going to run through the image and analyze all the different cameras and then give us an output. And the nice thing about this now is we have all this information. We can make any adjustments individually to the cameras we want to. We can change the exposure globally now on the image itself uh, or if we want to, we can even split this out for the ultimate control, split out those cameras individually into separate nodes with grades, and that way we can mask things if we need to hone in on certain areas. So now, another byproduct of stitching is ghosting, and the tool for that, or the node for that, is the C-Stitcher, and this is a powerhouse node. This comes from Ocula, which is a stereoscopic plugin uh, from the Foundry. Uh, it uses the vector disparity techniques that comes from Ocula. And what that means is if we go ahead and take a look at it, it's gonna analyze the image. And what it's doing behind the scenes is creating those vectors and now it's gonna push everything together. So if you look at the before and after, it's pushed everything in close together. So this is a work 
horse of a node. If we were dealing with stereo, we can enable stereo stitch here. We can make any changes to cameras. Uh, we also have options for stereo, eye separation, fall off type. And then you have the vectors tab where you can also do your tweaks. Uh, we can get more strength out of here. We can do more iterations on the warps uh, and the consistency as well. So say, okay, I'm pretty happy with where I'm going. I need to adjust the horizon line a bit more, but that's okay. So I'm gonna stop on the nuke portion of this right now and I'm gonna get Ken back up here. So we're gonna go back into my presentation. As I said in my altered world of my demo, I am the artist, Jocelyn is my supervisor. And I'm an artist, I wanna go, go into work and I wanna start figuring out what I need to do. Who's gonna tell me what to do? So I log into Shotgun, as I said, it's on the web, so it's a, a database on the cloud that everyone can access. I use my credentials to log in. The first thing I see is my project page. I go to a project I'm working on. This is what's called the activity stream. This is showing me everything that is happening on this project in one location. But a real powerful tool for an artist is, first of all, the inbox. They go to the inbox and they can see notes coming from their manager, maybe their supervisor, or maybe another artist. Here I'm being told that I gotta do the stitching, so I know that's part of the compositing task. So I go to my task page and I see the compositing task. I select it, I get a history of what has taken place to the shot up to this point before it's being handed to me. So I know who's worked on it and I know I gotta go into Nuke to do the stitching. Well, here's what's great. I can launch Nuke directly from inside a shotgun. And the benefit of this is my Nuke script and my Nuke project is now attached to shotgun. It's shotgun aware, I like to say. I'm gonna close shotgun down here. I'm sorry, Nuke down for a second. I wanna show you another way of doing the same thing. Now on my Mac, I could go to my dock. I could launch Nuke from there, but instead I'm gonna go up to the top of my UI where I see a little icon that reads shotgun. Click on that. I see all the projects I'm working on, and then I click on the project, and I'm gonna see all the creative software that I have on my system that is integrated with Shotgun. I click on the Nuke icon again. Nuke is gonna launch once again in that Shotgun aware state. And what I mean by that is Shotgun and Nuke now are connected. The project I'm working on in Nuke knows that I am working on the compositing task that is part of the shot, that is part of that project. So anything I export will go into the pipeline, which was already created for me by Shotgun. So I go over to the Shotgun menu, and you'll see here's the Shotgun open dialog box. There's the same tasks I saw in Shotgun that I'm working on. And I can also go to the individual shots and dr drill down into the different tasks that are associated and created in the Shotgun. So my job is the compositor. So I'm gonna select the compositing task, and instead of going to File, New, I click the New button down on the bottom, and now I am ready to start building my script in Nuke, and it's connected to Shotgun. Now, this is no insult to Terry whatsoever, but I think he took about 15 minutes to do that. I just did it in a second. So, anyways, here's the end result. Now, we are at the end of the result where Terry was, and we have a write node, okay? This is your typical workflow. You wanna render your files to disk, right? So you use the Nuke write node. But typically the artist has to know where does the file go? I gotta give it a name. I gotta, well, I'm not sure who I should tell so this is all rendered out. Well, if I go over to my toolbar, I see a shotgun tool. I click on this, it expands out four shotgun write nodes. These are gizmos that were written by us. And you can create your own and customize these to your pipeline or your needs. But we ship with the QuickTime, EXR, and a, a DPX. So I wanna add a 16-bit EXR shotgun write node instead of the nuke write node. So once we do that, it's brought in. And now we're just gonna repipe the end result of what Terry did into the shotgun write node. So understand this is a nuke write node, but it has shotgun wrapped around it because it knows where the file should go when it's rendered. It knows what the file's name is. If we look up at the properties panel, you'll see all the information that's already embedded into that write node that the artist didn't have to worry about and didn't have to think about. We want our artists to be creative. That's what they really want to be doing. They don't want to be working or worry about all these processes that are going in the background and so on. So all this information you'll see here shows you that it's all being taken care of. The artist is not worried about this. This has all been pre-configured. And of course you can customize this, customize all these different elements of it. I'm showing you shotgun out of the box, if you will. So once we start our render, it starts to generate the files. So we're writing the EXR files to our disk right now. And it's going to a specific folder that's all been predetermined and so on. And again, the whole point of this is that shotgun's taking care of this all in the background. But anyways, the video is just, a render is just about done. 
once the render is done, what we need to do now is share this with our studio or our supervisor or whoever we're working with, collaborating with. What would you normally do? You generate a QuickTime file, you go to Dropbox and you throw it up there and you email your supervisor and you say, hey, this is where it's at, and then they gotta email you back and communicate back to you, and that's not really a good plan. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go back up to the shotgun menu. You can see lots of different options now. Now that we are in a fully integrated a Nuke script in shotgun, we've got lots of stuff we can do. We can jump over to Shotgun directly from here. We can jump to the file system I just talked about. We can go into RV. We're gonna look at these options later, but what I wanna go is click on the Publish button. And this is going to open up the Shotgun Publish dialog box. And what's gonna happen here is Shotgun's gonna look at the EXR files that were generated just a minute ago. It's gonna create a QuickTime file based on it, and then it's gonna send that up to the web. But first, let's create a thumbnail. So we click on this, you drag it here. This thumbnail will now be part of this shot as it goes through the pipeline. We can add comments so we can clearly tell our supervisor exactly what was the purpose of the shot. What did I do here, and what do I need you to tell me? So this goes off out to the web, it's uploaded. The best part though is the person who needs to know or people who need to know that there's a new version that needs to be reviewed are automatically notified through Shotgun. I didn't have to contact anyone. It's all automated for me, okay? So now let's take a look at our supervisor. Jocelyn's gonna log into the same Shotgun project. She goes right to the same page and she sees that new version that was just rendered right there, okay, or uploaded right there. But a really powerful tool for a supervisor is what's called the media app. Here they see every version that's being uploaded that they need to review. They simply click on the play button for this and it opens up in what we call the overlay player. Now they can play back and review this footage and they can zoom in, they can pan on, they can stop frames, they can do all these different things to it. And more importantly is they can use several different tools to make sure they're communicating with their artists what they want done next. So in this case, Jocelyn's drawing over this guy's head, which is covering up the bike right there. She's gonna put text directly on this frame. And then when she goes to the detail panel on the side here, she puts more information. When she clicks submit, those notes and that thumbnail now become part of the history of the shot again. And the artist is going to get that information automatically. She can go through and start adding more annotations where she finds other things that need to be worked on, where again, the guy's head is blocking the car, as you can see there. She wants that cleaned up, rotoed out, whatever you got to do. I need it fixed. She adds those notes and so on. And then she can go through and add one more note. She wants to make sure they know that the camera crew has got to be rotored out. We need a clean plate of this. So all of this is going to be automated. She she sends this off to her, the artist. The artist gets the information in Shotgun, and now they know where to go from there. So now we're going to have Terry come back up again, and he's going to show you and do everything I just told him to do. Thank you, Ken. If we examine what we have to look at here, we're going to see it's going to be kind of a tough job. So what's happening is we need to, first of all, remove the people. Number one, and number two, uh, at the beginning of the shot, we need to have a clean plate for the bike because his head is covering the bike and his head is covering the car. Now, this seems pretty impossible because not only are we, we have our rig on a tripod that's being lifted up in the air, they're walking towards the camera. This is a tough job to do. If, let's just look for a moment and pretend like this was a static camera and we needed to remove the rig and how we would do that inside of car. Then we'll see how we're gonna deal with this type of shot. So there is a node in here, and this is the Swiss Army Knife node. It's called the C-Spherical Transform. And what it does is it will take an image of any projection type, in this case, lat long, and it will change it into another projection. So if I take it from lat long and into rectilinear, now we're inside the sphere. I can go ahead and look around. So I would actually look towards the rig. So let's pretend that he is a rig. And now we want to start to paint it out. Now the cool thing about this is because we're, we're going in here, we have a different pan, tilt and roll, uh, we're looking around, we need to get back to the lat long state. And the C-spherical transform can, can create, uh, create an inverse of itself to bring us back to that mode and its expression link. So whatever we keep on doing to this spherical transform, it will do it to that as well. Now Cara also has some tool sets built in for such occasions. So if I go under my Cara tool sets, I could choose like the lat long roto paint and it will create all these common nodes for us. So if we look at it, the first node is a C spherical transform. It's looking down uh, right at the nadir. And then we also have a roto paint no node. So I'll just go ahead and just do a, a terrible cloning job just so we, we get an idea uh, of what's gonna be happening here. Let me go ahead and look at the node. And so I'm painting out 
and cleaning up the plate and removing the guy. So say we, we do that, we go ahead and it's a static rig so we can remove everything. We wanna get back to that lat long space so we have the C spherical transform to bring us into that. We also have a merge already set to mat mode that we can be placed on top of it. So that would be fine and dandy except we have a moving camera, we have a whole other situation here. So what we wanna do is we wanna use a C spherical transform, convert from lat long to rectilinear, and we wanna point it at the area that we want to fix out. Now at this point, what we can do is really utilize this back and forth between Nuke and Cara. And this is nice because you can jump out of your stitch. We can be doing work using all of Nuke's tools and then jump back in. So I'll have a pre-rendered version of it here. So we're looking down uh, at the guys. And what we're gonna do is use Nuke's camera tracker, Nuke X, uh, to, to start tracking this shot. So what we'll do is prep it by just adding a roto ship. We don't want the tracker to take these guys into consideration. And then we're gonna go ahead and track the shot. We have a decent solve error, 1.42, that's, that's gonna work. And because of, we're using a 3D camera tracker, we get point cloud data. Now this is where it becomes very important because NukeX has a lovely point cloud generator node. So what this can do for us is, we can tell it, say every 15 frames create more points. So now we've actually recreated a piece of the actual set, or in this case, the outdoor, in 3D space. Now this is huge because now we have relative information, we have a tracked camera, and now we can start utilizing all this information uh, to help clean our plate. But even if we were going to maybe integrate, say something in 3D, a uh, 3D object, we now know exactly where to put it, uh, place it on the ground, there will be no slipping. We could even take this camera, send it out to another package, uh, render something inside of there, and then uh, bring that render in here and get it uh, into the lat long world as well. So now that we have this information, on the point cloud generator, we can select nodes, you can sorry, select vertices, and then we can assign them to groups. So we have two groups here. So one is the scooter, uh, one is the ground. So the first thing we'll do is take care of the ground situation. So how we do that is we create a single clean frame of the ground in the area that we want to clean up. So here we have a clean frame of the ground and the guys are removed. Or from, 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 sorry, from frame 780, we need to just clean this area down here. And we're just going to give it an alpha uh, for the area we want to project onto. We can even do things like we have a grade node. And because the luminance changes throughout the shot, we can animate the gain to accommodate for that. Now, once we have this information, we create an expression, uh, or sorry, a clone of that original camera that we just tracked, and we can tell it to hold on frame 780. That's where we painted the clean frame from. And then we're going to use a projector node. We're going to have our clean plate pumped into projection node, and then we're going to have the camera doing the projection. So this way we can project it onto a card in 3D space, and we can render it out with that tracked camera. So we have our tracked camera. It's coming around the side, and that's going to be using uh, the render now. So we have the C ray render node, and that is also a CARA node. It's a ray trace render node inside of Nuke, and it understands lat long as well. But now we've rendered this out in rectilinear view. This is great. Next thing we need to do now is deal with the scooter. So the scooter itself, because we have the point cloud information, we can make a group. And when you make a group, you can also bake it into a mesh. So we could take that group, we can bake it into an actual mesh and something we can project onto. So once we have that, let me just go ahead and collapse that. We have this geometry, now we can use that same technique. So what we'll do is find a frame where his head is not covering that scooter. So like right over here, his head is, is gone beyond it now. We can just get that area that we need. If we have any luminance change on here as well, we have a grade node, we can uh, animate the gain. And now we're gonna project onto that baked mesh. So we can use the camera to project to clean up the front of the, front of the shot uh, when he, his head is covering it. And there's also some spillover. We can use a card onto the ground. So now we have uh, the ground itself and the scooter. And because it's a curved body, we wouldn't get away with just putting a, a, a straight card there. We needed that shape for it to actually work. So now at this point, we have removed his head from the beginning of the shot. It's no longer covering the scooter. Now we also have to deal with the other guy whose head who's covering the car. So for this, we just need to clone out an area. So we just have uh, the car there. We're gonna go ahead and do the exact same technique. We're gonna use that camera again. We're gonna hold the frame on it. We're gonna use the projector node and we're gonna be able to project this image, the clean plate back onto the geometry. We use a card and then also have an edit geo on here so we can just bend up the card a bit. So it also goes onto the ground and we have the back of the car. So now at this point, we have rendered the scooter, we've clean, removed the guys, and then we also have the car fixed. So if we look at all three results, 
Here is the ground, the car, and the scooter. Now, the only thing is we're in rectilinear. We need to get back to lat long. But if you remember, the C-spherical transform can make an inversion of itself, and that's if we follow that green line. It makes the inversion of itself. So now we've gone back into lat long. So now at this point, we can place it back on top of our image and we've done the impossible here. We actually removed these guys from this shot and we were able to do so using Nuke's tools and Car's tools. So I'm gonna pause on this right now and ask Ken to come back up here. Of course I will. All right. All right, so we're gonna go back to my presentation real quick. Well, I'm gonna step back just a touch because I wanna show another way of connecting to your studio. So this is where Terry started that last presentation. Okay, he hasn't done the stitching, he hasn't, he hasn't done the rotor work and all that you just saw, which was awesomely cool. But normally the artist can go to Shotgun on the web and he can get the information or she can get the information that she needs, right? But what's really cool about Shotgun's integration, if we go back to the Shotgun menu, we have what's called the Shotgun panel. When I choose this, the Properties panel now populates with the Shotgun panel. And this is everything that that artist was seeing in the web on his browser or her browser now in their creative application. They're getting all the information they need, who's working on what, all the relative information they need to know that these are the shots that I need to work on. I need to roto the guys, I need to fix the cars. All of it's right inside of the creative tool that they want to stay in. So that's a really great way of keeping the artist focused in their application. And now we've switched over to where Terry just left us off with all the roto work done. We're going to do the same process as before. We're going to add a shotgun render node, a shotgun right node. We're going to do the connections to it. And since we've did this before already once, we're going to kind of fast forward this a little bit so we don't need to watch the render go in real time. But a couple of the key parts that I want to point out, since this is the second render that's being done associated with this shot, Shotgun's automatically going to update the naming to version number 002. It's going to create a whole new set of EXR files with the end result of what Terry just did. And then we're going to publish this back up to the web so that we can share it with our supervisor with all the road of work that's been done. I sped that up a little bit just to get moving along here. Okay, and now we're going to go to, there it is, okay, you're almost done. Let's just move forward. So now we got Jocelyn back in Shotgun. She's been notified there's a new version with the stuff that she was told, told the artist to do. So she goes to the media app, she opens this up, but she can't remember everything that she told him to do in that last version. So what's great is with Shotgun, since everything's connected, she can go back and look at the earlier version, see the history of everything, the discussion she had with her artist, and she knows that's what I told him to do. Let's see if he did it. But here's the problem, actually. Jocelyn is a very busy supervisor. Remember, I told you that in the beginning, right? Okay, she's not in the studio, she's out at a shoot. And now Terry, or Ken, the imaginary artist, is sitting in the studio waiting to hear this information from the supervisor of what am I supposed to do next? They're twiddling their thumb. Well, thank goodness we have something called Shotgun Review, which is Shotgun on your iPhone. She can log into Shotgun through Shotgun Review directly on her phone, access all the projects she's working on, access all the information you normally get going to the browser on your laptop or your system, finds the version she needs to play back and review. She now starts playing this back on her phone and reviews it to see if the artist did what she asked them to do. And when it comes time to make annotations or add notes, she can draw directly on her phone with her finger and put annotations on the frame. She can then go into the comments section, add the comments, this looks good, I like this. Can you try to stabilize the horizon a little bit? I love the fact it's coming up. Uh, I spelled the word wrong, that's too bad. Oh wait, we have spell check, okay good. That's helpful for me. But you'll see that we have all the notes. Jocelyn, the supervisor, is never disconnected from the studio, never disconnected from their artist, and everyone's staying connected, they know what to do. So Terry's gonna come back up, and he's gonna work on stabilizing that horizon for us. Okay, so let me get back into Nuke and let's open up another comp here. So now we have to deal with the stabilization of the horizon line. So in CAR, there is some, there's a couple of ways we can approach this. So the first thing we can do is create a C tracker. Now this is CARA's tracker. If I go ahead and plug it in, you'll notice it feels very similar to uh, Nuke's tracker as far as the attributes go, except there's a difference here. If I create a point and place it on here, we can see in our zoom window where I'm placing it, but if I continue off canvas, it knows that I'm working in a lat long image, so it continues to wrap. So what I'll do is I'll place uh, an image 
close, uh, sorry, a tracker close to the horizon line as possible. We're kind of cut off uh, on the street here, but this is pretty deep in that we'll get a good stabilization from. And once we do that, we have some attributes here. We have our pan and our tilt that's been taken into consideration, but we need something for roll. So what we're gonna do is create another tracking point. And we wanna put this tracking point around, around the same depth as, uh, as possible uh, of, of that tracking point as well. So if I place another one on here, and then I go ahead and choose roll. So what happens now is we see that we have this green line and this is actually color coded. So if I was to move this back, you'll see it's red. And it's not telling me how good this track is gonna be. It's telling me the optimal position to place this roll point on here. So if I go ahead and put it back into that area where I had it, it's even telling me the roll, uh, the degree of the roll. So you wanna try and be 90, 90 degrees uh, adjacent to it, but this is gonna work as well. So once we've done that, you can go ahead and begin to track. So I could just grab uh, all the track, uh, all tracking points and then go ahead and track it out. Now, afterwards you have a choice. So we could actually create a match move from here. So if we were integrating something into the shot, we can have a match move, track match move, or we can choose to stabilize the shot. So once you create the stabilize, you get the uh, C spherical transform that's been stabilized. And now we can stabilize the horizon line and we've stabilized and we pinned it down. So if we look at the, difference before where it's all wonky and going wobbly uh, afterwards we completely stabilize it now this shot we'd probably approach in a different way because we're moving forward with the camera again we can use nukes camera tracker so we go ahead and look in a direction and then what we can do is prep if there is anything in the way like him we don't want the camera tracker to take him into consideration and then we can track the camera and then once we do that, you have the option, if you have car installed, that you can create a C spherical transform or a metadata transform directly from here. That way we could plug our original footage back into it. And because we're traveling in Z space, then we would want to more likely for this shot, do it this way. And we can use the 3D camera tracker to stabilize the horizon line as well. So that's gonna wrap it up for the nuke side of things. So I'm gonna get Ken back up here. Thank you, sir. No problem. All right. Terry, excellent job. Okay, so Terry had just finished, or the imaginary Ken just finished all that great stuff. And we need to render this out again. So we're gonna go really fast because we've done this twice. I don't wanna be overly redundant. But again, I just wanna point out that Shotgun's automatically updating the file's name to version three because it's the third version. It's generating these EXR files that are going directly to a specific location that the artist didn't have to worry about. All of this has taken place, and we're just gonna talk about some of the other integrations. So I mentioned this earlier. You choose Jump to Shotgun, you go into your browser, and you go directly to the actual task that you are a part of. So that's really cool. From Nuke, we went right into the browser with where we were at. I mentioned the file structure before. We can jump to the file structure coming through Shotgun, and now you'll see I'm in the folder that is related to this shot that I'm working on. And there's a whole bunch of different folders, one for each task that has been assigned to this shot. And there's one that's called comp. I've been working on the compositing, right? So I can expand that, and you're gonna see a whole bunch of older folders, other folders. But wait, it goes deeper than that, because we can go to work, and I can expand Nuke, and I can see all the Nuke scripts that have been saved as I've been working on this. Again, this is all automated. There's also something called snapshot. If an artist wants to save a state of his script at one point, maybe they're experimenting, you can create a snapshot. And above that, you have the images folder. There are all the EXR files that were rendered every time we did a version render. And the artist didn't care where they went. It was all automated. And above that, the review folder. This shows you the QuickTime files that were generated when you created that publish. The stressing point of this, what I'm trying to say is, this is not what the artist wants to be focused on. They want to be creative. They want to be using these cool tools. All of that is automated in the background, which is just a great feature of Shotgun's integration into these products such as Nuke. All right, so let's go back to our supervisor now, who is needs to view the new version that was just created, version number three, okay? Now, typically, what are you gonna do? She comes into the media app, she's going, no, you know what she wants to do? 
There's a point in your pipeline when you need to start looking at the raw media. This has been great so far, but we've been looking at web-based QuickTime files, whether it's through the browser or whether it's through the phone. And now I need to see the actual EXR files, and I want to review those. So what's great about Shotgun is it comes with RV. RV is an image and sequence player that you, we acquired about a year and a half ago. Every subscription seat of Shotgun gets RV. And it is a standalone program on your laptop or your system. You can open it up and you can bring in files and watch it. But even cooler, right here inside the media app, your supervisor can right click on the thumbnail and say play in RV. RV will launch automatically and it's going to locate those EXR files that are on your local storage. It's going to now put those into RV. And now we're still connected to Shotgun. We're using the high-res media to review this, and the supervisor can now play back the high-res to see full color. And RV has tons of different compare tools that you can use. You still have access to all those histories. Just like you saw inside the browser, it's available in RV. You are still connected to Shotgun and that actual project. This is 360 VR footage. So we want to review it that way. I don't want to review it this stitched out, laid out way. So what's great about RV? is we have what we call our lat log viewer. So we'll go up to the image folder, and we're gonna come down to our lat long, and we're gonna add it to the viewer. Now, we're looking at the stitch footage created as if I was wearing the headset. I can even start to rotate around and view all 360 degrees of this footage that has been stitched together and get a perfect review of this. I can even play it back and continue to rotate around to get and see if there's any issues or any other changes that the supervisor wants. You want to add annotations? There's your tools. You can draw on the frames just like you did inside the Shotgun web browser. You go, you add your information, you say this is approved, this is good, all connected in Shotgun, so in Shotgun, it's gonna update in the activity stream that we saw earlier, but not only in Shotgun is it gonna update, it's gonna update in Nuke inside the Shotgun panel. So the whole point of this was, we are connecting the artists and the supervisors so that there's no lag in time. Nobody is disconnected. The information is never lost. It's always one place you can go to, and that's really the whole focus of the Shotgun integration with Nuke and other creative applications. That's the presentation for Shotgun and Nuke. Maddie's gonna come up. She's gonna talk uh, about flicks, I believe, right? So I'm going to, you're using the same? Yeah. Okay. We're done. I'm done, thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone. So I think we can agree that was extremely complicated, but so, so cool. Um, I'm quite frankly jealous because my product, and the reason I'm familiar with it is because I came up in a pre-production world that is just eons behind what you guys are doing in shop production. Very disorganized, very chaotic, and eventually we decided, you know what, time to say stop. We can automate some of our processes and we can do story development in a more intuitive, clever way. So that's what Flix is. It's Foundry's pre-production hub. It's our story development pipeline tool. So. If you've ever worked in pre-production, I think you're probably aware that you have a bunch of departments running around, each iterating really, really quickly and not communicating with one another. And somehow all of this information needs to make it to shop production in an organized way. And it's a mess. Um, a lot of time is wasted. It's not great. So Flix basically sits at the center. This is actually a very shotgun-like premise, but it has a slightly different approach to it. It's designed to be more fluid and nimble, given the nature of pre-production. We're not attached to shots. We're not attached to departments, per se. It's iterating quickly. The beautiful thing that you guys should know about Flix is just that when all is said and done, after you've been circling and developing your story, we have integration with Shotgun. So actually what happens, publish to Shotgun, it's gonna populate out your shots once you're done with rough layout or previs. So you're starting on a clean slate rather than a disorganized, horrible one. Um, I'm not gonna take up too much time explaining this because I know I have a lot of compositors in the crowd and you're all like, I don't care, Maddie, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do it. But if anyone's interested in learning more or think that this could be useful to their company, if you guys have storyboarding problems, if you have previs problems, if you're having problems communicating with a studio as a vendor because they're giving you disorganized nonsense, let's talk after this, come find me, and we can get into more details about Flix. Um, but that's really it, Maddie Laser Flix. Foundry, we're so glad you all came today. I hope it was you know, informative, and I hope you guys are interested in learning more about Shotgun and Nuke, um, particularly Cara VR, because that stuff is just bananas. Um, so have a good day, go back to the bar, mingle, hooray.